imaginations have been gripped for thousands of years by the story of Noah. How long ago did this Neolithic family live? What was the scope of the cataclysmic deluge described in their story? Was the building of the ark, the gathering of animals two by two, the repopulation of Earth with only eight people allegory? Metaphor? Was it literal? Tribes in New Guinea, India, Brazil, China, Norway, Mexico, and North America First Nation peoples all have a flood story. And each story tells of a favored family. Several stories mention eight people specifically who survived on a boat and two thirds of the stories attribute the disaster to humankind's wickedness and over half end with survivors landing on a mountain. To date, anthropologists have collected between 250 to 300 such flood stories from various cultures. So what is God teaching through such an iconic story? What are we to come away with, regardless of how we interpret the ancient evidence for a worldwide or a more regional flood? The story of Noah is unsurprisingly centered around the man named Noah. When he was born, his parents somehow sensed he was special. When Lamech fathered a son, he named him Noah, saying out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. Lamech was talking about the curse God had sunk upon the ground, not because the ground had transgressed God's commands, but because the first man had. God had told the man, because you have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Lamech put great hope in his son that somehow life on earth would get better because of Noah. And the record tells us that after Noah was 500 years old, Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, just a parenthesis, hang on to that age. It's important later in the story. But my question is, who was Noah's wife? A shadowy figure, she is never mentioned by name, though she is spoken of five times throughout the flood account and specifically included in God's instructions to Noah. Noah and his family's story opens with God's great grief and sorrow over how corrupt the earth had become. Noah was all that was left of Seth's godly line, and God intended to rescue that remnant. So God made a covenant with Noah, and by extension, Noah's wife and his sons and his daughters-in-law. But because of the unsalvageable wreck of earth, God washed the slate clean and preserved this one remnant, a family of eight, and a sampling of Earth's creatures. Finally, after much time had passed, God brought this remnant out into a fresh Earth to start anew. There is an epilogue to this epic, and even though Noah's wife is not mentioned, it doesn't mean she was absent. It is the sad but inevitable story of Noah's decline, of dissension in his family that ended in a curse of which repercussions would be felt for a thousand years and more in Israel's history. So let's start with God's covenant. Centuries of scholars have searched the scriptures and sacred writings in an attempt to identify Noah's wife. Of the half dozen or so theories, the candidate who seems most possible is Naama, Cain's many greats granddaughter. Lamech's second wife, Zillah, bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. The sons of Lamech were all inventors, and some Jewish traditions associate Naama also with the arts of singing and literature. And considering Noah's notable character and godliness, it seems safe to assume he looked for a similarly godly wife of noble character, a woman who could partner with him in following God, a capable and strong woman. And between them, they raised three sons and found wives for them as well, even in the midst of a desperately wicked time. Because here's the description of their time period. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. Evidently, the people of Noah's day had reached a degree of depravity that threatened to irreversibly contaminate the earth. 
Hebrew words used here to describe such evil are shachaf, meaning morally putrid and totally decayed, spiritually gangrenous, destroyed and wasted, and chamak, which means seeking to gain through assault, physical attack, cheating, and oppression. Women in particular were especially targeted by angelic beings for the basest sort of wicked acts, the product of which were the Nephilim mentioned earlier in Genesis 6. Of exaggerated strength, size, and violent aggression, the Nephilim were the ultimate example of this spiritual and physical debasement and perversion and degradation of the human race, which would bring about God's cleansing judgment. Because corruption had become so widespread and so complete, God pronounced total destruction as the only solution. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. There is no question Noah's wife and sons, as well as their daughters-in-law, contributed to the building of the ark. It was a mammoth task, even for eight people working side by side, and probably their work site became their home. And apart from what they had to do to subsist, to farm and herd and weave and cook, they poured themselves into this project. What must that have been like for Noah's wife? When other women her age had begun to enjoy their grandchildren or met at the well or baked at the communal ovens in the center of town. Instead, picture Noah's wife leading and guiding her daughters-in-law in working beside their men, sawing, hammering, measuring, and fitting as the massive structure of the ark took shape. Here is where godly character would have been crucial. To be faithful in doing all God commanded. To believe in faith God's commands are sound and worthy of being heeded to persevere over long years of labor, to endure the hardships and sacrifices necessary, to anchor hope in God's promises even when their fulfillment is long in coming. They could not have known the ark would also be a symbol or a type pointing prophetically to Christ. It was made of gopher wood. No one today knows what type of wood that is, but the words gopher and pitch in this passage are also the Hebrew word used later on in the Torah for atonement. All three words have the same basic Hebrew word, which means to cover. So we can think of the ark as being made from atonement wood or redemption wood and pitched with or made waterproof with atonement. There was only one door into the ark, only one way, literally, to be saved from the coming disaster, and it was this one door made of atonement into redemption. For us today, we see a corollary to the Lord Jesus Christ, who said of himself, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved. And he also said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when comparing Noah's age, when his sons are mentioned, remember that was 500 years, and Noah's story commencing, and Noah's age at that point when the floodgates opened, here we have it, Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came on the earth, then we find out how much time transpired. And we see that God grants grace to all people because it seems God granted all the people in that antediluvian time a hundred years to consider the Lord's coming judgment and God's provision of salvation. Evidently, all the while Noah and his family were building this ark in plain view, Noah was a herald of righteousness, meaning he was telling all who would listen about what was coming. That brings us to the story of God's conservation. This is perhaps one of the most awful chapters in human history. Destruction so widespread, loss of life so colossal, we can hardly imagine it. At a certain point, it was time. The ark was ready, the food gathered, preparations completed. Judgment Day had come. Noah and his wife and his sons and their daughters-in-law now saw to the last of the work, bringing in seven pairs of clean animals, of flying creatures, and otherwise a male and female of every wild creature. God specified seven days for this procession, and then the deluge would commence for the next 40 days and nights. When the last creature had entered, the Lord shut them in. In a scene reminiscent of creation, God cleansed and renewed the earth, just as in the opening lines of Genesis' first chapter, 
when the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So now, God would return the earth to a formless void, dark storms overhead, and from every vantage, only the roiling waters would be visible. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. And through this scene, through this terrifying and terrible event, we discover that salvation comes in response to God's call. Because every single living thing that entered the ark, every person, every creature, went in response to God's call with willing obedience. The burden of decision was God's, not Noah's, to close the door, sealing them in with atonement pitch. Nevertheless, as we imagine the ark heaving in the storm, so we must imagine the people inside heaving. Their world was being destroyed. And even though God had deemed none of it salvageable, still their hearts must have been broken over all those, all those people and people that they loved, all those creatures, all those gardens, all the beauty that perished that day. But then comes God's recreation. The next chapter opens with the words, but God remembered. And it was not that God had forgotten and then remembered, but rather God had kept this family continually in mind. God remained concerned about Noah and Noah's wife and sons and their wives and all the creatures the Lord had so carefully protected. First, God had been at work the entire time, preparing the earth to receive those waiting in the ark by sending a great wind. And as the wind blew, the strange forces which produced the deluge were reversed. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. And that kind of brings us back to mind of those first days of creation, when the Lord moved God's Spirit across the face of the deep, when light and dark were separated, and then the waters were separated from the sky. And the next, God remembered by giving them a sign, through the sending out and returning of the dove, signifying the emergence of land, which corresponded to the third day of creation. Noah sent out the dove from the ark, and the dove came back to him in the evening, and there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then Noah waited another seven days and sent out the dove, and it did not return to him any more. That reminds us of when God separated the waters and the land. And then God remembered Noah with words. The last words God had spoken were an invitation to come into the ark. Now, over a year later, God invited everyone to come out into a new world. Because according to the text, they had been in the ark for over 15 months. And Noah's wife would have been key to their survival during that time. As matriarch, it would have been her privilege and responsibility to oversee the care of the animals and the daily domestic aspects of their lives and the harmony in their relationships. I turned to Proverbs 31 to imagine her. And as you read through it, think of the kind of woman she might have been. Noah knew he could trust her in these strange and stressful circumstances because she was the woman who had labored together with him for a hundred years, building this vessel, raising their sons, finding their wives, and mentoring them. She would have been the one who oversaw the weaving and sewing of their clothes and linens. It would have gone to her to measure and oversee all the food and all the preparations for their meals, as well as the food for all their animals. To her went the inventory of the cargo, for these were the tasks of a matriarch. Noah's wife was the one to take care of any that ailed, to care for their needs, whether human or creature. She was the first up in the morning and the last one to bed, not doing every task, for there were eight of them, but overseeing every domestic duty, because this was her area of authority and expertise. I picture her also as a woman of wisdom. As the proverb says, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy. Her husband, too. And he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. 
Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the city gates. So now, in a burst of activity, she joined Noah and their family in entering into the newly revealed earth, being filled with every kind of living thing, along with God's blessing and mandate, the same one God had given the first human beings and creatures in Genesis 1. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you, of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. And the final scene is one of worship and prayer. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. Lamech's prophecy over his infant son, 600 years before, was fulfilled in God's promise. For never again would God cause the earth to pay the price of humankind's wrongdoing. And from this story, we can see that God's salvation is new birth. This cleansed earth is a picture of new creation, new beginnings, new birth. It is also a picture of the smaller events of our lives, which involve a crisis of a judgment and painful ordeals and new beginnings. Every experience of forgiveness begins with a mini deluge of hurt and harm, but ends in this scene of a dove with an olive branch, an opened door, and a fresh start. But there is an epilogue, the consecution of these events. God's promise was also prophetic. For though the earth itself was renewed and replenished, it was still the same human nature. Yes, godly and God-fearing, but the same human nature which stepped out of the ark. No one and his family had lost everything they knew and held dear, apart from each other, as they went through the flood of God's judgment. They were utterly alone, without home or possessions, friends or extended family. Nothing. They came with nothing into this new world. And now, as they worked through their grief and leaned into their new lives, the sons and their wives began to raise their own families, and presumably they spread out into their own settlements. God made another covenant with them, with a rainbow in the sky, to remind them that God would never again destroy the earth in this way. But God would now put fear and dread of humans into every living thing. They would now be permitted to eat flesh as well as plants. They would not be permitted to eat blood because blood was the life of that creature. And God would require a reckoning for human life. Whoever sheds the blood of a human by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image, God made humankind. God's word came in response to the unchecked violence and bloodshed of the culture they had grown up in. The rapacious and amoral culture that had affected them probably far deeply than they knew. Imagine how shocking this must have been. All their animals now feared them and ran from them and resisted them. And even in their small community, God had introduced a sense of dread, for there would be dire repercussions should any of them turn on each other. And there were signs of fraying, even in the godly Noah. Noah, a man of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. But when Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. To uncover the nakedness of someone, at least in the book of Leviticus, held a sexual connotation of some kind. So whatever happened, it was horrific. It was horrific enough for Noah to level a curse against Ham's son, Noah's grandson Canaan. For the ancient reader, this would have explained everything about Sodom and Gomorrah and about the Canaanites my mind goes back to Noah's wife, the mother of these three sons, and the mentor to their wives. 
Finally, the grandchildren had started to come, and in the great lonely expanse of Earth, their little clan was growing. But now, so soon after their salvation, there was this terrible thing that had happened, really to them all. Her husband violated, her son alienated, her grandson cursed. Even as matriarch, there was little Noah's wife could do to soften these blows. And as much as Noah's wife would have felt her mother's heart swell over the maturity and grace of her two older sons, how her heart must have broken over the wrongdoing of her youngest son and how this would harm their community. Still, I come away from this story with this final truth. The fruit of a holy life is revealed in love. For you and me today, this epilogue helps us to show grace to each other. Just as Noah's other two sons showed grace both to their father and to their brother. And I like to think how Noah's wife showed her love to them all. Thank you.